Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Taiwan Post New Wave Cinema uh, Series. I'm Bi Yu Zhang, uh, the Deputy Director of the Center of Taiwan Studies at SOAS. It is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Christopher Brown to talk about one of Taiwan's uh, major directors, Zheng Youjie, and also who's the focus of this week. As many of us know about this, that uh, there has been abundant of academic research on Taiwan New Wave and the important uh, authors uh, associated with it. And yet academic research on what has followed is few and far uh, between. When we planned the series uh, early this year, we came across Dr. Brown and his work. You know, it's, it's a rare find, I have to say, uh, because not many people really write specifically about uh, younger generation uh, directors. Dr. Brown is an academic as well as a filmmaker. He is senior lecturer in filmmaking at the University of Sussex. He has written on Taiwan's uh, cinema, especially the post-2008 cinema, and also uh, cover uh, topics like film practice as research and many more. He is also the academic consultant for Queer East, uh, a festival we are actually quite familiar with. Uh, the, the festival showcases South and East Asian LGBTQX sorry, plus films to the UK audiences. Most of all, we really are looking forward to his forthcoming books on recent Taiwanese cinema. And maybe Chris can come back for another round and introducing his uh, new book next. So his talk today focuses on Zheng Youjie, right? And uh, uh, this talk provides a kind of overview of Zheng's work, including Do Over, Yi Nian Zhi Chu, Erling, sorry, 2006, and Yang Yang, 2009, and his television series, Days We Stare at the Sun, 他们在毕业的前一天爆炸, 2010. And of course, one of the film we are really familiar with as SOAS, we have shown it three times, uh, Wawa no Sido, uh, uh, 太阳的孩子, 2015, and so on. So Dr. Brown looks at Zheng, Zheng Youjie's cinematic approach in representing multiple, uh, uh, multi-layered and often con contradicting sort of identity and also mapping the contested uh, concept of space and place. Before we formally start the talk, I would like to thank our funder, as usual, the Ministry of Culture, Taiwan, and also the Cultural Division at a, a TRO in the UK. Please be aware that this session is recorded. Please turn off your uh, audio and video uh, to make sure the uh, quality of the recording. We will start to take questions 30 minutes into the session. And our assistant curator, Shao Yi, will make the announcement uh, when the chat function is open. Could you please uh, post only one question at a time, at most two, and keep them succinct and also relevant to the, uh, uh, the topic, uh, Chris's topic. Shao Yi will collate those questions and present it to him. So without further ado, Welcome, Chris. The floor is yours. OK, so um, thank you very much. Um, really pleased to, to be here. Um, in this talk, I'm going to provide an overview of Zheng Yujie's work, focusing on his feature films Do Over, Yang Yang, My Little Honeymoon, and Wawa no Sidao. I'm also going to look at his short film Unwritten Rules, as well as his TV series Days We Stared at the Sun. So I'm going to start today by looking at Jen's thematic preoccupations, questions of stylistic consistency, and then his focus on performance. But my, what I'm hoping to do is to set the scene by talking about these themes for the main focus of the talk today, which is on mapping, approaching the director's films in terms of mapping. So like his contemporaries whose work has been showcased at SOAS these past three weeks, um, 
Jim uh, began making films after the new Taiwan cinema and its second wave had finished, and he operates in a very different industrial context to those movements. Following the runaway success of Wei the Shanks, Cape Number no. Seven in 2008, the industry is far more commercial in orientation. And it's worth pointing out that at a personal level, this entails pressures and disappointments. We often talk about this in the abstract, but over the last decade, several of his feature films have fallen apart at the last minute due to funding problems. He's really persistent, however, and has proven versatile, directing feature films for cinema release, as well as a TV movie, short films, music videos, and two runs of a TV series. This year, he's received a lot of industry recognition for his latest film, Dear Tenant, which uh, reunites him with actor Mo Zhi, who earlier appeared in Do Over, right at the beginning of his career. Both of them, um, as well as the film, have been nominated at the Golden Horse Awards this year, so we'll have to see if any of them win next weekend. The film's currently on release in Taiwan, though not, not here in the UK yet, so I won't, I'm afraid, be covering it today. So as I said, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about themes and the style of his work. Jen's work can productively be approached in terms of his thematic preoccupations. Central to his are the identities of marginalised characters who feel caught between cultures and face multiple forms of discrimination. There's the illegal immigrants from Thailand in Do Over, the mixed race protagonist of Yang Yang, the Vietnamese housewife in My Little Honeymoon, the indigenous tribe in Wawa No si Dao, and the gay widower in Dear Tenant. These characters find themselves at the intersection point of multiple axes of injustice. The director's characters are all culturally hybrid in one way or another, and their experiences expose tension points in contested notions of national identity. So for instance, in Do Over, the character of Ding An enters Taiwan, excuse me, with the help of a criminal gang um, who force him into a life of crime, effectively holding him hostage with a promise of an ID card that never actually materialises. And in the film, the character literally has to fight to obtain his ID card, a symbol of belonging, but one which is ultimately shown to be a hollow one. Some of Jen's protagonists are not Taiwanese and are subject to discrimination for this reason. Others are Taiwanese, but suffer from historic structural discrimination. For example, the indigenous community in Wawa no Sidao, whose ancestral land rights are threatened. I think in his earlier films, at least, these representations of exclusion are rooted in Jen's own experiences. So he's the son of a Taiwanese mother and a Japanese ethnically Chinese father, and grew up in a bilingual household. It was only at school that he learned Mandarin for the first time. Around his first year in elementary school, he experienced bullying due to his Japanese heritage and was transferred to another school. After that, he tried to conceal his background for a while. For example, he wouldn't allow his dad to visit uh, the new school. Jun has spoken about how prior to making films, he constantly felt the need to prove his Taiwanese identity. The director himself is undoubtedly reflected, I think, in some of his earlier protagonists. Yang Yang's hybrid heritage causes her to internalize a range of external pressures, while language issues are, are de directly represented in My Little Honeymoon. Within Chong Er's household, each family member prefers a different mode of communication. She prefers to speak Japan, but, sorry, Vietnamese, her husband Mandarin, the, mo the mother-in-law Hokkien, and the child doesn't actually speak at all. All of Jen's work dramatizes the unsustainable containment of pressure, characters who simply snap when faced with overwhelming difficulties and odds. With varying degrees of success, they take a stand against a society that has wronged them. And this is articulated through some recurring visualizations, such as the slide here. So we've got characters blocking roots with their arms outstretched. We see that quite a bit. That said though, apart from a few motifs, I think it's difficult actually to find much stylistic consistency in Jen's work. And this is also true, I'd say, of many of his contemporaries, certainly when we compare them to the work of earlier Taiwanese auteurs, whose stylistic signatures are readily apparent. In the case of Do Over, for example, Jen cites a diverse range of influences, including Christoph Kozlowski, Jim Jarmusch, Jim Jarmusch, sorry, and Quentin Tarantino. Kishlowski's film Blind Chance was one of the first films that the director saw at a film festival. 
um, and do over make similar structural use of three successively told stories which are affected and indeed changed by a common incident. Uh, moreover, when Ding An fight, uh, sorry, Ding An fights his way out of the gangster's building, the legacy of Tarantino is visible, especially his Kill Bill films. The film features an impressively staged sequence shot from behind the head of the character in a single take as he's repeatedly assaulted by a group of thugs, but somehow summons the energy to fend them off. The film has a dazzling set of visual devices on display, including footage taken on an MP4 video phone, strobe lighting scenes and frequent use of bold colored low key lighting, as we can see in the shot here. Yet each of Jen's other films are quite different stylistically. Yang Yang is far more pared down. His shaky handheld camera work owes a stylistic debt to the aesthetics of documentary, cinema verite. You could trace this back to the traditions of the French New Wave or American indie practice, ranging from John Cassavetes to Spike Lee. My Little Honeymoon and Warren Dao, on the other hand, are far more classically shot and lit and edited in a far less frenetic manner, though the latter does accommodate some long takes designed to capture the activities of non-professional actors. Consistency of style, though, has never been a priority for Jen, who insta instead tailors this to fit the story, the format and the type of audience he's looking at. Nor is he identified with any particular genre, although he's proven adept at blending and breaking genres. Do over transitions from a crime thriller to an art house drama to pretty much a stoner movie by the end. The first series of Days We Stared at the Sun is a genre breaker that commences as a high school teen drama, but then evolves into an insistent critique of the social, economic and political pressures facing a young teenager. And the final episode is in this respect, bloody and subversive on many levels. One thing that Jun's films do have in common, however, is an insistent focus on the act of performance. Now, how that's expressed might vary in different pieces of work. But it's in performance that we can see the director's most clearly defined, consistent and self-reflexive preoccupation. More precisely, his work might be said to focus on the differences between performance and performativity. Though it's worth saying that Jen himself does equate the two, re recalling an acting coach who he says, quote, that everyone in every minute is performing. The only difference between actors and normal people is that actors perform at a conscious level, but normal people do it subconsciously. The director's ch uh, characters challenge the roles that society requires them to literally or figuratively act out. One explanation for this is that Jen, Jen himself is an actor. So those of you who watched the Lin Shu series last week would have seen that um, he appears in The Pain of Others in a central role. He's also in Winds of September and he's got many other credits. Spider Lilies, Design Seven Love, The Village of No Return and a load of TV credits and other films as well. So it's perhaps unsurprising, given his first-hand experience, as a director, all of his work emphasises acts of performance and their mediation, and often in a self-reflexive manner. So Do Over is to a large extent a film about filmmaking. It opens on a film set with the character of Xiao Pang, stopping traffic and laying tracks for a dolly, then later standing in as a double during a love scene. In My Little Honeymoon, Chong Er's plight is visualised in highly theatrical terms. She puts on a brave face following a false accusation and she begs her husband and mother-in-law to be understanding. But the minute she's out of their sight, she starts crying. The family home in this sense becomes a stage and she breaks down when she's out of view of the audience, which is kind of what they are there. In Wawa no Sidao, the people from the tribe are, sh are shown dressed in traditional costume, performing, performing dance shows for tourists in a conscious display of self exoticization if this is represented in kind of ambivalent terms, then at the level of filmmaking itself, the approach to performance is far more empowering. So most of the cast are non-professionals, locals who are in many cases reenacting fictionalized versions of events in which they themselves participated. The film dramatizes a real life incident in which corrupt land requisition led the villagers to stage a demonstration in the fields. Perhaps Jen's most striking sta uh, statement on the nature and complexity of performance comes in Yang Yang. The character of Zhang Xinyang is a young mixed race woman whose mother is Taiwanese and whose absent father is French. 
She experiences the pressure that the the pressure of performance, both as a track sprinter and later as a model and an actress. The film returns incessantly to her, her athletic training and physical prowess. Her stepfather, who's also the coach, stands at the side of the athletics track with a stopwatch, noting the time it takes her to run a lap, barking advice and orders. The director said that in some senses, athletes and actors are alike in that they spend their lifetime preparing for the stage, as he put it. When Yang Yang begins her career in modeling and commercials, the pressure she feels at being asked to perform is explicitly linked to her mixed race identity. Her agent knows that in the entertainment industry, being a mix sells, and Yang Yang is potentially bankable talent. A shot in which she inserts blue contact lenses to conceal her brown iris strikingly confirms how her beauty is conceived in racialized terms. Blue eyes are preferable for a local audience, and when she appears in her first film, her hair is also dyed slightly brown too. So ironically, to succeed in the Taiwanese entertainment industry, even Yang Yang must become just a little bit whiter. This is uh, captured by the film's poster, which shows the pressure that she feels in performing this ideal of beauty. She stares numbly ahead, the top, the top half of her iris blue and the lower half brown, as you can see there. Her body has become a hybrid mask. This emphasis on the performative qualities of gender and sexuality is assisted by the structure of the narrative, which prominently features one male character in each half, two different types of masculinity whose performative qualities the film ultimately lays bare. Throughout the director's work, the pattern is similar. Marginalized characters are asked to perform, to play the role expected of them in order to conform to cultural norms that are shown to be hypocritical, corrupt and illusory. When I interviewed the director a few years ago, I asked him about the scene in Waranosi Dao in which the locals dance for tourists. I put it to him that all of his films seem to be about people putting on a show for others, as I've just suggested. And I, what I wanted to do here was to see if he would draw attention to his own or parallels with his own work as an actor. So I asked him, was he interested in the theme of performance because he also works as an actor? The response was a little surprising in a way, because I've been thinking of uh, the biographical, but instead he referred instantly to the national. No, I don't think so. I think it's because it's part of real life. Everything is, everyone is basically pretending. The difference is whether you do it consciously or not. I have this feeling, in fact, that everyone is pretending to the extent that this whole island is pretending it's the Republic of China. You know, our name is the Republic of China, but to be honest, we're Taiwan. We're pretending we represent China. So I think our country in a certain way is based on an illusion. We can see these ideas articulated in his earliest work. So in Do Over, Ding An questions why he tried so hard to get into Taiwan, given what he considers to be its artificiality. Fake passport, fake money, fake dignity, he says. Is there anything real or was this never a real country? The implications are fairly clear and explain Zheng's insistent fixation on acting and pretense. He considers nationhood itself to be something performative. Questions of the national are central to his work as director. And this is something that's even suggested by the English name of his production company, Filmosa, which is a pun on Formosa, Taiwan's historical Portuguese name. Yet in mounting a critique of Taiwanese identity and those whom it marginalizes, his films and TV can never, nevertheless be seen to map the island out as a distinctive environment. His work in this sense doesn't reject ideas of nationhood, but instead it remaps them. In order to explain what I mean by this, I'd like to turn to Unwritten Rules, which is one of the director's short films, a comedy included in the 2012 compilation 10 plus 10, which is itself an interesting project as it showcases the work of several filmmakers who later achieve prominence. So in Unwritten Rules, a group of filmmakers attempt to shoot a scene whilst avoiding the enormous national flag that's attached to their wall, uh, to the wall in their ill-chosen location. The flag can't appear in the film for fear of making it unsellable in mainland China, so the director orders his crew to remove it. Jen himself perhaps has fewer um, compunctions about this when compared to his contemporaries. James Udden notes the conspicuous absence of the ROC flag in the comedies You Are the Apple of My Eye, The Wonderful Wedding and Our Times, all of which were commercial ventures that achieved box office success in the mainland market. 
By contrast, most of Genio Che's films feature the national flag at some point, as does his TV series, though in no instance is its use especially patriotic. In Yang Yang, the flag flutters over the athletics ground where the protagonist trains, which is ironic given that Taiwanese athletes can't internationally compete under this flag, but instead under the emblem of Chinese Taipei. And this topic is completely openly discussed in the second series of Days We Stared at the Sun. So I'm just going to play a short clip from the film now um, to show you what happens as the crew decide to remove the flag. So as the flag's torn away, the director realizes to his horror that something worse lies underneath, an old map of the Republic of China, the full greater China that incorporates the mainland uh, and Taiwan and other regions. The old map is viewed by the young filmmakers with horror and embarrassment because it represented, of course, a geographical fiction. Paradox paradoxically, a state without territory, the Republic historically laid claim to the mainland only through maps without having any actual control there. But if earlier filmmakers were asked to endorse this kind of fiction and faced actual censorship, then here Jen suggests that contemporary filmmakers with an eye to the Chinese market engage in self-censorship. These are the unwritten rules of the film's title. But behind the mockery here is a serious point. The questions of how filmmakers should negotiate the industrial and geopolitical realities of the more commercial environment post 2008. It's interesting that in Unwritten Rules, the director uses a map as a focus for questions of nationhood. That maps are instruments of power as much as a representation of the earth is by now well established, and maps are central to any construction of nationhood. But in the case of Taiwan, their role is particularly acute given the island's contested status. Bi Yu Zhang has examined how the KMT sought to legitimize their regime in post-war Taiwan by asserting strict control over cartography, indoctrinating school children, and deterring the public from reading, owning, and using maps outside of classroom and military settings. She argues that this had a profound impact on the generation's perspective on their environment. Taiwan became de-privileged in the national imagination, resulting in people having a lack of intimate knowledge of their locality or any affection for it, a distorted sense of place. This began to change from the mid 80s as tourism and democratization led to an increased availability of maps. Review regulations were formally abolished in 2004, after which the Ministry of the Interior discontinued maps that incorporated mainland China and began to publish only maps of the Taiwan region instead. In other words, a new kind of filmmaking emerged in Taiwan at around the same moment that an outdated form of mapping disappeared, the years around 2004 to 2008, the first part of the 21st century. And what I'd like to suggest is that the two phenomena are linked and that recent Taiwanese cinema can be seen to represent a new form of mapping, a concerted effort to chart the island as a distinctive environment. Like map makers, filmmakers creatively interact with a national, offering a historically situated interpretation of physical geography. An aerial map of an island may be etched in our minds as being Taiwan, but a map is not the same as a nation. And in certain contexts, aerial maps of Taiwan offer a way of asserting national pride and distinction without attracting the political controversy associated with the flag. So the recent film, The Gangs, The Oscars and The Walking Dead is a case in point. The appearance of a map of Taiwan in a crucial scene in this crucial location, and it appears again and again, serves no obvious narrative or thematic purpose, but is constantly there um, on screen and in the background, reminding us of where the film is set like much of the, of the rest of the film, is cheerfully gratuitous. Cape number seven is seen as a turning point in Taiwanese film history, the point at which a new type of cinema emerged, and numerous critics have explored the ways in which it presents southern Taiwanese and Taika identity in a distinctive manner. The film itself um, resulted in the production of maps too, so it led to a tourist craze in Hong Chun where the action was shot, uh, with maps produced so that tourists could visit the locations and, as the advertising campaign put it, find the address of love. So there's another sort of key to this, and it's sort of on, on the map on the on the left, it indicates uh, where the particular scenes are, and you can match them up to the pictures on the next page. And on the right, we've got a map there that's signed by the stars in one of the locations. 
But if cape number seven was an important symbol, I think it consolidated rather than generated what I'm referring to as a new interest in cinematic mappings of the island. In the years preceding its release, a number of films appeared which evidenced these new preoccupations. Do Over was one of these. Others were Island Etude, The Most Distant Course, Exit Number Seven, Godman Dog, and Dayu, The Touch of Fate. Maps appear in many of these films, while mapping as a concept is a central concern. In Dayu, for example, maps appear three times in the film. First, when the teenage runaway Dayu must decide whether to begin a criminal lifestyle by pickpocketing for the first time. Waiting at a newly constructed bus stop, he stares at the route map while his older mentor cautions him that there's no turning back once he starts down this path. The map captures a defining moment in the kid's life, his decision to embark on a rite of passage from which he'll be unlikely to return. A second map appears in the estate agency where Dayu's mother works. Her job is to sell newly built apartments, which she advertises to clients using a map indicating the proximity of the real estate to future MTR stations and future commercial districts that haven't been built yet. So the map here confirms the ongoing redesign of the city around its relatively new expanding MTR network and by omission, the effacing of older neighborhoods that the new residential complexes that she's selling will replace. Finally, there's another map. Uh, when the police chief uh, consults a map of Taipei, uh, while a cellular phone call is being traced, which sets in motion the climatic encounter between the police and the gangsters. So the three maps in the film help shape plot, characterization and context, indicating how the city and its inhabitants are being reshaped by new transport and technology networks. In analysing the film in this way, I'm drawing on cartographic approaches to film studies as articulated in seminal works by Giuliano Bruno and Tom Conley, and subsequently by others such as Les Roberts. This approach tends firstly to theorise the appearance of maps on screen within films, and secondly to approach cinema itself as a form of mapping. For example, exploring historical and conceptual connections between filmmaking and cartography, or the presentation of geography on film, or the effective emotional qualities of screen journeys. Film study scholars' reconfiguration of mapping has productively challenged cartographers to rethink their discipline, yet it's largely been undertaken with reference to European and American traditions. This ironically replicates the oversight of an earlier generation of cartographers. In a series of seminal chapters published in the History of Cartography in 1994, Cordell Yi uh, challenges uh, 20th century critics who have tended to appraise Chinese maps in relation to quantitative Western models, emphasizing scientific and mathematical measurability. The emphasis he places on the Chinese tradition of mapping as accommodating subjectivity, relativism, and emotion to a perhaps greater extent than Western models seems to preempt some of the formulations of film cartography that would emerge a decade later. Mapping is acutely important in the context of China's uh, contested territorial claim over Taiwan. So it does seem an omission that there's not really been a consistent, comprehensive attempt to consider Taiwanese cinema in these terms, in terms of cartography. The exceptions tend to focus on case studies and on the earlier auteurs of the new Taiwan cinema. For example, there's Frederick Jameson's case study of Edward Yang's Terrorizers, titled Remapping Taipei. Constructions of space have certainly been discussed in relation to the auteurs of the new Taiwan cinema, but rarely in relation to maps and mapping, though occasionally, as some of the references here uh, show. For example, there's been interest in the scene in Rebels of the Neon God, in which Shao Kang's blood drip, uh, drips onto a map of a textbook. Mapping tends to be referenced only obliquely in relation to later cinema, for instance, in studies of the island circuit films like Island Etude, uh, which feature characters traveling around Taiwan's coastal circumference. These films have also been explored by critics. Returning now to Chen Yuqie, um, several of his films feature maps on screen. Conley argues that maps of this type help underline, he says, what a film is and what it does, but also bring into view a site where a critical and productively interpretive relation with the film can begin. In My Little Honeymoon, Chong Er comes across a map at a roadside food stand after she runs away from the town of Mainong, where she lives with her husband, taking her daughter on a road trip. 
just going to play a brief clip of the scene in which she comes across the map. The map here serves several functions. So firstly, it situates the story within a real life environment with a reasonable degree of accuracy. The mother and daughter take a route that is possible to travel in real life, while later locations appear sequentially as they drive, as we would as they would if we were taking um, a trip on this route in real life. But the film's mapping is also effective. So up uh, until this point, Chong Er has been stuck in Meinong, a hacker district which is located inland, roughly equidistant from Kaohsiung and Tainan. We learn she's barely travelled around Taiwan at all. It's her daughter's art teacher, an indigenous woman named Mingchen, who broadens her horizons, having travelled extensively. She also teaches her how to drive and the two become friends. Uh, this teacher subsequently moves to Taidong, and later when Chong'e runs away and begins exploring the island for the first time, she decides to visit her friend. The film here resembles the kind of emotional cartography discussed by Juliana Bruno, specifically what she terms tender mapping, drawing on Madeleine de Scudery Cadupé de Tendre, a work which made a geographical documentation of relational space in the form of a map by which women might navigate in interpersonal relations. She argues that this, later, this tender mapping later crossed into film. And in this context, we can understand the resonance of Taidong on the roadside map. You are here, it states, she is here, and the camera movement anticipates where she will be. It moves diagonally up to the right, following her gaze in a point of view shot as she mentally charts a course to her friend in Taidong. The city is represented in pretty utopian terms and her journey there is tenderly mapped, an effective route of empowerment. However, I'm also interested in what happens when the map appears. While Chong'e is looking at it, her daughter accepts two free plates of food from the guy who owns the roadside food stand. The mother's immediate instinct is to reject this gift from a stranger, and we know from earlier scenes that her proud husband would consider this to be shameful. But the stall owner urges her to accept it, saying that otherwise the food will go to waste. The map affirms this ethos at a figurative level, for in deciding at this moment to travel to Taidong, Chong Er acknowledges her desire for sustainability. This is in line with how the film as a whole is structured around a central metaphor of environmental balance. Its first half has the couple spraying their crops with pesticide. This causes Chong Er to have health problems with historical undertones. Her mother-in-law makes offensive comments about the use of defoliant during the Vietnam War. Chong Er's problem is literally and figuratively her environment. So it's telling that in the second half of the film, the couple switched to organic farming methods, which helps set the narrative context for her actions there, her embrace of a form of sustainability that is as much emotional as it is environmental. Wawanu Sidao features several maps and focuses attention on traditions of counter-mapping. Jen co-directed the film with Legal Shumi, uh, an indigenous filmmaker whom he met while researching another project. He said, that the film main, he said that the film's main reference point is Legal's documentary, Wish of the Ocean Rice, which is about his mother's role in restoring a paddy field. In the film, Panay quits her job as a, a journalist in Taipei to return to her children and ailing father, who live in the village of Makudai on the east coast. Overseeing the restoration of her tribe's derelict paddy fields, she comes into conflict with developers who are seeking to build a hotel complex on the tribe's land. The film dramatizes the tools of mapping at work. We see a land survey taking place on a woman's paddy field that developers have acquired with the assistance of corrupt officials. It's being surveyed in preparation for the construction of a tourist car park. The activity we see taking place, the acquisition of data through the scientific measurement of distance and topography is the raw material that will be used to produce a map. Prior to this, we've also seen estate agent Shen Shong uh, photographing Panay's land from multiple angles, acting on behalf of Chinese clients who are seeking to develop tourist facilities in the area. Jokes are made about the value of the Yuan, with the apparent suggestion that the mainland is informally territorializing Taiwanese indigenous land. And in this sense, we need to bear in mind that mapping never simply reflects reality, but seeks to bring it into being, as Tong Chai Winichakel's classic study of Siam and the construction of Thai nationhood demonstrates. Maps first appear in the film in a critical scene in the estate agent's office when Panay's daughter Nakao decides to sell her family's land. He tells her that she's underage, but then finds a way to facilitate it anyway. 
Their conversation is filmed in a series of shot reverses in which behind each character, a map of a local area of the local area can be seen. We later realise in, in a later scene that there's maps all over the wall of the office. These are all aerial renderings designed for official purposes, offering a rationalised and apparently objective overview of local territory. The estate agent and the developers acquire power through their ownership and management of maps. Behind his shoulder uh, on the right there, we can see a map of the region divided with clear, stark, bold boundary lines into discrete divisions. This type of map conflicts with indigenous spatiality, which Robin Roth argues tends to produce multiple overlapping and flexibly bounded territories, which defy easy representation into neatly delineated polygons. In 2001, Sai Bowen and Luo Yongqing were invited by the Council of Indigenous Peoples to assist on a project to map traditional indigenous territories. This was launched following Chen Shui-bian's victory in, two, in the 2000 uh, presidential election. Members of three tribes from the Atayal, Truku and Paiwan ethnic groups participated and were asked to map and visualize their environments using GIS 3D virtual environment technology. Counter and community mapping of this type challenges hegemonic notions regarding to whom particular terrain does or should belong. But it's also been seen to have unintended effects, including increased conflict, privatization of land and increased state, state regulation. But Roth doesn't see these effects as the inevitable outcome of mapping per se, but rather as the result of a dominant conception of space that frames the cartographic representation of indigenous territories, whereby complex spatiality is rendered as abstract space. In Wawano Sudal, we see community mapping depicted on screen. While the film itself could be said to adopt the form of a counter map, challenging abstract notions of spatiality and instead emphasizing the lived environments of the inhabitants. In deciding to restore the paddy fields, Panai holds a meeting of the local community and presents an irrigation plan for the restoration of the fields. This is, in effect, a counter map, her vision for a sustainable community that differs from the official maps we see in the estate agent's office. It's informally drawn, it's not necessarily to scale, it's multi-perspectival. It identifies locations not exclusively from an aerial view, but by using pasted situated photographs and drawings which encourage emotional identification. Panay is aware of her audience, however, and when applying for a subsidy in a presentation to academics and funders, she uses an aerial photograph, imagery that this particular audience is more likely to relate to. She co-ops the tools of aerial survey of objectivity to suit her community's own purposes. The editing, even, uh, moreover, makes the relationship between the map and the film map apparent. As Panay delivers her presentation, the jagged rocky edges of the Fengbin coastline are visible on the projection behind her. The editing then cuts to a shot of exactly the same rocks, except this time filmed from a situated perspective and it, as we see the grandfather, her father, looking out to sea. So I'll just play a brief clip of that edit. So the meaning of the edit seems to be clear. Maps and aerial views of landscape rely on the pretense of accuracy, objectivity, but they disregard how land might be experienced and felt and understood by those who inhabit it. Jen and Legal are careful not to draw too false a dichotomy, however, making it clear that the loss of ancestral land is not solely the responsibility of outsiders, nor are transnational flows portrayed as inherently negative, as de demonstrated by the, the viral YouTube video of Nakao's protest that ultimately saves the community. There's also a degree of ambivalence in some of the production design in Panay's home, which again involves a map. If you look carefully sort of at the top right there on, on, against the wall, you can see that there's a globe, a map of the world that's evocatively placed alongside a European ship and nearby is also a picture of Jesus. These objects, the map, the means, the message, allude to colonial travel and conquest, the historical effacing of local indigenous culture.
but it also signals the integration of Christianity into tribal communities where it remains a source of profound spiritual meaning. The religion has apparently shaped the perspective of Panay's family. When Nagao uh, stands in front of the digger with her arms outstretched in the climactic scene, this recalls Christian iconography of martyrdom. Referring to the reception of the film, um, the director has this to say. When we screened the film in Taipei, many people considered it to be very remote, as if the story belonged to another country. Some people didn't even believe that what they saw had really happened. However, back in Hualien and Taidong, people responded to it very positively. This kind of feature film, that is a commercial film shot from an East Coast perspective, focusing on Hualien and Taidong is rare. Other films have been shot there, but they're still from the perspective of Taipei. They do not offer a genuinely local perspective. So this, along with things like the editing decisions I've just discussed, point towards filmmaking itself as a practice of mapping. Certainly his comments tell us something about how the film was received, but equally they indicate his intentions. The two directors wanted to map out the East Coast on film from a local indigenous perspective. For Dennis Wood, maps are fundamentally propositional, and map makers, as he puts it, extraordinarily selective creators of a world, not the world, but a world, whose features they bring into being. Filmmakers arguably have something in common with this. Jun's films, like many of um, his other contemporaries, are propositional in this way. In mapping out the island, filmmakers bring into being the features of a nation that might be. The director's work certainly covers a lot of space, both um, individually and taken in composite, while travel is a significant theme and form. In Do Over, it often feels as if the director is trying to offer a cross-section of environments within Taiwan, facilitated by the character's movement from place to place. In the first major storyline, Ding An starts out on the periphery of Taipei. He then drives along the motorway, passes a road toll booth, picks up his friend Gao, and then drives through a tunnel. He reaches a rural area and then gets out of the car, walks through the long grass in the field before finally reaching the seashore. All of this just takes 13 minutes of screen time. There's definitely a narrative purpose. Um, Ding An wants to tell his friend to tell him the truth about the ID card. But these scenes also capture a spatial tra trajectory from the city to the coast, a visual mapping in which diverse environments appear sequentially. The film's subsequent storylines also feature journeys. However, these are entirely subjective, abandoning any notion of geographic accuracy. The second storyline takes on the quality of a visual collage as characters travel along a drug-induced route that incorporates a scattered set of locations. They visit a hospital, a mountain hut, fields, a woodland tunnel before exiting in the middle of the city. Match cuts in action create a fluid, effective movement through environments that are in reality not adjacent. Whatever's being achieved in narrative terms, the effect here is a kind of cinematic tourism. The showcasing of Taiwan's diverse environments and landmarks such as Taipei 101, which at the time had only been open for two years. We see similar visualizations a few years later in Chen Yingrong's film Young Dudes, which focuses more on post-industrial landscapes. Trajectories of this type, mapped routes between center and periphery, are central to Jen's TV series Days We Stared at the Sun. The first season was released in 2010 and initially intended as a standalone miniseries. Over five episodes, it tells the story of Hao Yuan, a teenage boy who is facing challenges on multiple fronts. Female authority figures are entirely absent from his life, while male authority figures, his father, teacher and a local politician, are all revealed as compromised or corrupt. Their activities, along with the social forces they represent, leave Hao Yuan feeling a sense of powerlessness and betrayal. That said, much of the series proceeds in the manner of a typical high school drama, following the personal relationships of a group of teenagers. Believing ourselves to be in this genre, we might doubt whether the likable Hao Yuan will triumph over his obstacles, but we never doubt that he'll always try to do the right thing, and certainly never doubt for a moment that he'll survive. But in the final episode, these assumptions prove to be false. The suicide of his father tips Hao Yuan over the edge. He decides to enact a nihilistic revenge on the congressman who's become a focal point for his anger. But in the process of trying to assassinate the man, it's Hao Yuan himself who is shot dead. It's not unheard of, but it's pretty unusual for a TV season to kill off its protagonist in this manner, 
and certainly not in this generic context. The bulk of the first series takes place in Taipei, Taipei suburbs, shot in the areas around Danshui, and largely adheres to the tropes associated with portrayals of the hometown. This is typical of the high school genre, which in various national contexts relies on a sense of the local, of distance from the specificity associated with urban centres and landmarks, even if access to these is occasionally granted. It's perhaps something intrinsic to the genre's coming of age dynamics. Adult filmmakers already have temporal distance on the subject matter, but they seem to need spatial distance too, as if in memory, childhood happened over there. Another reason the ending shocks is it because it shatters this illusion completely, signaling the intrusion of identifiable contemporary social realities. The second season, released seven years later, focuses on Hao Yuan's classmates, um, particularly the character of Cheng Yi. Uh, given the time that has elapsed since um, series one, which is obviously unusual for TV to have that many years, no attempt is made to continue its specific storylines. Some characters are effectively abandoned, others are added, and there are big changes in setting and tone. So the action now takes place in central Taipei, and from the outset, the storyline and themes are explicitly political, indeed highly politicised. The season dramatises the involvement of Cheng Yi in a university society called The Wave, a protest group that campaigns for political change. It directly depicts the sunflower movement, student movement and protest of 2014 against the passing of the cross-strait trade agreement with China. It's a fairly rare fictional screen representation of these incidents and certainly doesn't self-censor. In just the first episode, characters debate the relationship between China and Taiwan, assert their support for Taiwanese independence and discuss the national flag. The director explained why he approached the second season in this way. Our cast were young people who were around 17 years old when we made the first series. Five years later, they are at the age where they're graduating from university. During these years, society in Taiwan has changed and young Taiwanese people, especially university students, have to a great extent participated in this change. It seems to create an opposition of generations. There's the generation of university students who are younger than me by about 10 years and the generation of those who are 50 something. I happen to be in the middle. This generational conflict is now very strong. And you can see this, for instance, in the Sunflower Movement or the movement against proposed school curriculum changes by the government. But if the characters' ages make sense, then the question does remain, why explore these issues using the exact same characters and in this particular TV series? Presumably, Jen could have made a standalone series on the same subject. Market considerations are important. Um, the first season gained quite a cult following, so it's logical to follow that up. But clearly in his own mind, the themes are deeply connected, despite apparent differences in subject and genre. I'd like to suggest that the mapping of national space and the retracing of mapped emotional roots is central to this. Days We Stared at the Sun explores sites of political awakening, tracing connections between places in the hometown where the seeds of activism are sown as a result of localised personal experience, and then the centre where change is enacted on a national mediated scale. I think there's a self-reflexive component to this, as in 2017, the director reflects on the implicit radicalism of his earlier series, where, he asks, does political change begin? In the first series, the characters rarely venture into central Taipei, and when they do, their excursions are associated with negative adult activity. There's a brothel overseen by some gangsters, and then a recording studio um, where Ding Zhu's music is rejected. Otherwise, the city is glimpsed in the background, generally out of the character's reach. They live on the periphery, though they're connected to the centre by municipal architecture and networks. Even on a countryside walk, they find themselves at the foot of an enormous pylon. By contrast, the characters in season two circulate around environments in central Taipei, in which social and political change can be enacted at a national level. So a university, a law firm, a law college, media outlets, and so on, as well as the public areas around the legislative and executive yuan. Characters are constantly in and out of the exit of Shandao Temple MTR station, for example. Yet the city's symbolic center is Taipei 101, occasionally glimpsed in season one, but far removed from the character's everyday reality. By contrast, in season two, the character of Qin goes inside and up to the top. Taipei is laid out before her in aerial overview. 
The haze adds to the impression of a flat background plane while she is sharply in focus in the foreground. Idly outstretching her finger, she points as you would when consulting a map. Like the aerial photograph of the coastline in Wawano Sidal, Chen is offered an overview, but hers is certainly not an objective perspective nor an unemotional one. Ironically, she's actually an exchange student from China who maintains a pro-unification stance. Her opinions are shown to be rooted in informed judgment, but she's patronised by members of the wave who assume that she's been indoctrinated. So she, so she speaks at this point in Taipei 101 to her family on the phone, feeling sad and isolated while she looks at the view below. When Qian finally leaves Taipei and also the series, she is shown crying, looking out of the window of the plane of the city below. So for a second time, the season's only Chinese character is granted an objective aerial overview or apparently objective one. In the second half of season two, the storyline involving the real life protests comes to an end and a new plot gets underway, relating to a corporation dumping of illegal waste in a coastal community. By this point, the character of Xu Rong has, has emerged as a major protagonist and training to be a journalist, he heads from Taipei to the East Coast to find out what's going on. As, as the second season returns from the center to the periphery, it formally begins to resemble the trajectory of the first season. There's an emphasis on entropy as Shuron, increasingly disaffected and erratic and targeted by vested interests, finds himself drawn to violence. His experience comes to resemble that of Hao Yuan, almost like a palimpsest, and indeed the audience is directly invited to make the connection. Season two opens with Shuron exclaiming, this is what I call a deliberate act, as he protests against a corrupt industrialist. This directly echoes Hao Yuan's words from the opening of season one. The end credits used for each episode of season two also allude to the characters' shared tra trajectories. The credit sequence shows vehicles moving along a coastal road with police cars coming into view. For most of the season, we don't know what this footage is. We ultimately find out when we get to the final episode. It's the police who are on their way to confront uh, Shuron, who's kidnapped, who's kidnapped the corrupt industrialist and he's gone into hiding. So the end credits of previous episodes anticipate the ending of the drama, offering a glimpse into the future. But there's something else going on here, because strikingly, the footage is played in reverse, so the cars appear to be driving backwards. This seems to confirm that although they didn't know each other, the clue to Xu Zhong's actions lies in the past, in Hao Yuan's lived experience backwards in the past. So the repeated credit sequence both anticipates and revisits at the same time. To conclude, in Days We Stared at the Sun, Jen maps out the centre and periphery while alluding to shared and repeated emotional trajectories. He does, that, he does this to reflect on where the rationale for social change comes from, from what environment, and in what form it is best enacted. While he evidently sympathises with Xu Rong's desire for a radical break, he ultimately sides with Cheng Yi, who favours incremental change from within existing social structures and institutions. The implication is that had these structured structures functioned in the first place, Hao Yuan would never have taken the action that he did. And in realizing this, Cheng Yi is ultimately able to save his friend from the same fate. Cheng Yi does this by using a map, and it's one that again is interpreted emotionally. He asks Ding Zhu to recall Xu Rong's probable location from memory with the assistance of a map. So she does this and the route that she then indicates is the exact same route that we see depicted in the season's end credits each time. Uh, to wrap things up, it's worth noting that repetition, the retracing and revisiting of routes, both spatial and emotional, is a hallmark of Jin's work. In Do Over, Xiao Hui traces two routes along the lines of her hand, suggesting the dual realities that exist within the story's universe. Yang Yang is traumatically compelled to repeat, an idea I've explored elsewhere with the film's second half retracing the, the major narrative beats of the first in the, mal in the manner of a palimpsest. In My Little Honeymoon, Chong Er has taken the same journey as countless other Vietnamese women seeking to live in Taiwan, and within the film follows her friend's route to Taidong, and then the husband then follows her. At the end of Wawano Sidal, Nakao decides to leave her tribal community to study in Taipei, thereby revisiting the route taken many years earlier by her mother Panai, who has since herself returned. 
So in the talk, I've tried to sketch out some ways in which Jenny Ochia uses maps in his films and TV, and also suggested how his work itself could be seen as a form of mapping. I think this is an approach that could have broader resonance in the context of post-New Wave Taiwan cinema. While there are certainly precursors, there, no there nonetheless seems to have been a moment around 15 years ago when a lot of Taiwanese filmmakers, often of diverse backgrounds and styles, began to focus on charting the island as a distinctive environment. So I think mapping offers a lens through which to examine Taiwanese cinema over the past couple of decades and complements existing studies on authorship by suggesting a, sh a set, a shared set of cultural and aesthetic concerns. Ho Jitran made a comment in one of the Q&As the other day that I found interesting. He said that the emergence of post-New Wave cinema wasn't solely about a set of individuals, but also, as he put it, the process of a particular time. Mapping is above all else a process, it's a practice, and as such opens up a range of questions and possibilities as we look at recent Taiwanese film. So that's that's it. I think that's where I'll leave it today. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. It's amazing. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay. I suppose um, <laughs> before we open the floor and asking questions, um, I have to say it, it is, uh, um, I didn't expect this topic, which is uh, um, really close to my heart. Um, yes. <laughs> um, may I ask the first question? I got the privilege to, as the chair. I, I, I have to say I'm really pleased with this opportunity to ask uh, Chris about this. Uh, Chris, uh, thank you, because uh, it's such a, a fascinating and a quite unusual approach uh, and to think about not just Zheng Youjie's film, but also uh, uh, talk about the all the younger generation Taiwanese uh, directors as a whole. In many ways, you are actually uh, drawing uh, quite a lot of uh, examples from others as well. Uh, thank you very much. You connect the changing sense of place and the duality of identity in this kind of cinematic sort of expression in many ways. It seems to me, maybe I got it wrong, because it's, you have written such a, a succinct and a so com uh, you know, com really uh, 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 concise sort of argument. Um, it seems that you see this to be a like a general characteristic of the uh, uh, younger generation uh, director's work, not just only in Zheng Youjie's film, because the particular emphasis you put on, especially on cartography in your talk, it seems to me it, you suggest uh, his attention mainly is placed on a uh, national level. Mm. That's my, 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 my reading of what you're saying. Yeah. How about the sense of locality mm. and localness yeah. in their films? And how, in your view, a closer relationship between the Taiwanese and the cinematic expression of this kind of localness and locality can bring to a heightened identity? Can you, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit about it? Yeah, um, gosh, it's tricky to like, um, if we take his, his films as sort of an example, um, I'm just thinking, so for instance, in, in My Little Honeymoon, um, actually, I mean, I was referring to the, the the last third of the film, where she does travel and we see her going around different environments in the south, but actually the bulk of the film um, is is takes place pretty much within their home, in the within the domestic sphere. And and in the local area, the the, the, the town there may not, um, which obviously is, is distinctive for a number of reasons. Um, but I think there's no reason. I, I was focusing on sort of the, the bigger national questions, I think, today, but there's no reason why that can't be sort of can't be focused on on the domestic sphere. And we see a lot of films lately emphasizing the the apartments, homes, houses, as mm. in theatrical terms, something like Dear X does this as well, like makes the contrast between the theatre space of the drama group and then the home where the characters live. Um, and also it can be, you know, critically, you could approach this, I mean, 
uh, Juliana Bruno does do this, talking about kind of interior journeys within a room, people who never actually leave a space, but mm. they, they emotionally, mentally travel. And I think that's actually central to My Little Honeymoon. So the character yeah. spends her life confined, imagining possibilities and anticipating possibilities, and then is, then is able to, 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 to actually take the journey. Yeah, so um, I think there's various ways in which he um, he frames the desire to, to travel from within very small spaces, and I think that's probably true of of most directors. Um, so yeah, perhaps I, I focus today more on the on the the, the travelling and the and the and the experience of the island as a whole. But yeah, certainly the, this could be applied to the local. I think. Mm. Okay, um, I actually got more question, but I think I'll, I will leave it to Xiaoyi to ask the question first and then come back. Thank you. Xiaoyi. Yeah, um, I think, um, our next few questions actually come from um, our, uh, yeah, our friends and, and professors. So maybe should we, uh, maybe they could, they could ask the question. Um, uh, so Lafa, would you like to Oh. Um, if not, I'll just read out. Oh, sorry, sorry, because I didn't have the sound. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um. Yeah. Maybe you. you yeah. To, uh, um. Yeah. In fact, I had just I have a question and I have a remark. I really would like to thank you, Christopher, for for your beautiful presentation and in fact the all the maps also remind me how in films Taiwan was Papa, always, yeah. can you switch on your uh, video oh please? sorry yeah well well thank you yes I don't know how okay <laughs> um it reminds me on of how Taiwan was always mapped uh, in films you know, from the Japanese era in, in, in documentaries where you have always maps of Taiwan and the exploration and films mapping like trains, film with trains, mapping the, 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 the mastering of Taiwan by the colonial power. And then you have that also in many in some um, documentaries in, in, in at the time of the Guomindang when they arrived in Taiwan especially in a film called Mei Li Bao Dao. So I think also in, in, in Zhen Yuqie, for me, he has a lot of irony. And you can see this kind of irony in his uh, work, the way uh, between official maps and the maps in his film and how he maps the territory in his film. But my question, sorry about that. My question was, um, for me, it was always hard to understand why, and maybe it's uh, close to what Corrados is saying, uh, I really have a question because I think Zheng Yuqi is a very special director um, and very different from the other directors of his uh, generation, especially because it seems never to compromise with the productions or he really addresses the political issues. And I would like to know if you agree with that or if you don't know, or I don't know. It's really... Um, yeah, I, th I, I think it's true that um, he's the of all of that, whether we call them a generational group, um, but he's the one that seems unafraid to explicitly direct, uh, address questions of, of uh, national identity, the relationship with China, even, even as I said, that the, you know, the depiction of the flag in itself is, is quite a big deal because that immediately rules you out of particular markets. And he does in virtually everything he's made, except one, I think. Um, it's and in quite obvious ways too. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, the, the sunflower sort of movement has not been depicted except really in documentaries, but not really in, in fiction. Yeah, so I, I totally agree that I think he feels, um, you know, he feels um, that he's able to do that, and that's something that he wants to do. Um, whereas we don't, ex we, we don't see that quite so explicitly addressed in other in other filmmakers' work. I was interested in what you're saying about the documentary. I'd like to look at the the the, the colonial documentaries because I mean these aerial views are quite common in documentaries generally. But something that what one reason I sort of began to think about this project was the what I think the absence of maps in in older Taiwanese films that audiences would have seen until we get to the new cinema kind of period. Um, the, yeah. Yeah. In fact, you have also this kind of opposition in official cinema and the Taius film, 
because you know Thai stream are also a lot of being crossing the country from the countryside to the city to the south and everything and it's a kind of a because official cinema was much more focused on Taipei and well and the, yeah and the maps you see most of the films are like the maps of the entire China of course but um, yeah yeah it's quite interesting to see this kind of opposition but they're often kept out of the way sort of yep. like the husband's secret you do see a map in the police office but you know it sort of indicates authority we don't we don't really see it we don't really get a sense of what it means or the details but to me, the really funny one was Tarzan and the Treasure, because this is a film about a map. It's a treasure map, and we never <laughs> see it. And we see them holding this bit of paper, but we never actually look at it. Um, pro probably censored, um, or or maybe it's actually the script. I thought at one point the actor was holding the script. But uh, yeah, they, they, they seem absent until until the, the new Taiwan cinema. And, 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 but that has implications for sort of how space is constructed as well. Because often they're quite, um, some of the Taipian like have disconnected spaces as well. So I think that that reflects the absence of a central map sometimes. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, um, Corrado, Professor Mary, also has a question. So would you perhaps like to raise the question? Do you read it or? I don't know. Um, yeah, I think we can hear you, so maybe you can you can uh, read your questions. Okay, so hi, hi, thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, thank you very much. Would you I, like to switch on your video? I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So, thank you for the for, for the great talk. Actually, I have got two questions, but they are kind of. Um, Related. At the very beginning of the talk, you mentioned a lack, if I remember correctly, of stylistic homogeneity in and maybe also his generation. And just yesterday, we or, or in, in the past week, we were trying to figure out why there might be a lack of Western or festival recognition of this new generation of, of, of filmmakers. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate. A bit. Have an idea about this lack of stylistic homogeneity, if it's personal, generational, or has something to do with the digital era or the geopolitical situation, etc. And the second, related always to the auteur theory. Mm. I haven't seen the TV show. It's really a question, it's not a tricky question, it's a question of curiosity. Do you see a continuity between you know, movie, universe, and TV, uh, as I mentioned? Twin Peaks is obviously Lynch and made and part of his you know, things. Okay, I didn't get that. You might have to repeat the second one. Sorry, I lost you a little bit there. Sorry. A stylistic or in a uh, continuity in TV yeah, yeah. and film. I just downloaded the TV show and so I've seen few images and it struck me as very TV or you know digital image and not as uh, picture. Yeah as his movies, but then I haven't seen the episode before. So yeah. You see a continuity, like you, you get one episode of Day Staring at the, uh, 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 of the Sun, as you get one episode of Twin Peaks, and you say, oh, this looks like David Lynch. And right. it, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you see something like this. In okay. Diverse. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the first, yeah, the first question, I mean, this is sort of why I began to think about um, the, the question of, of mapping or another approach in the first place because it did seem to me that these most of these directors who have emerged in the last 15 20 years um that they don't necessarily have stylistic consistency in their work and i i do think that this is is probably a factor in why some of their films haven't been recognized uh internationally um particularly as you know the model of the the taiwanese auteur has been this kind of it's often been it, it's it's there's the particular house style um, associated with that, sort of the wide, the the, the wide shots, the the long takes, the use of silence, and so on. Um, it's often associated with a particular kind of modernism or postmodernism that does it. Even at the time, I think excluded other voices. So someone to me who always seems a precursor for sort of uh, filmmakers now is uh, Sylvia Chung, who never really fit into this model either because. Yeah. For various reasons you know partly she's she's a woman um 
also the use of melodrama um, in her sort of her embrace of that, the sense that because she was working in in, in other places that she wasn't sort of making necessarily Taiwanese um, uh, film films about Taiwanese national identity. But I think she's an interesting person to look at in terms of how uh, how we might approach auteurs today, because I think she sort of has some of the same characteristics as they do, in the sense that she's not necessarily wedded to any particular style. Um, sorry, there's a police car just, <laughs> not for me, I hope. Um, but if you're looking for sort of auteurs in that sort of the new Taiwan sort of m model, I guess, like if, for people who have emerged in the last couple of decades, I mean, it seems to me there's sort of only really two. You've got Midi Z and then you've got Chung Mong Hong, um, who, you know, in, in stylistic terms are sort of readily identifiable. You can watch their work and you know it's them. Um, whereas most of the others that I wouldn't say fit into that category. So it's partly, I think, we need to rethink like, what, what do we expect from a director? Um, you know, do, do we even need to make a case for them as auteurs necessarily? And it does, I think, show how wedded we are to this question of style. So in a way, I thought, well, it, performance for me is one way of looking at Cheng Yuqi's work in terms of a consistent focus and then mapping is potentially something that's shared by a range of different directors, but that they could articulate it differently, such as we get this performative element, uh, emphasis from, uh, from Chen Yuqie. So yeah, my, the reason why I was sort of thinking about mapping is partly to get out of this difficulty of the fact that there is no stylistic consistency in, in many directors' work, um, I, I don't think, which is not a, a criticism at all. You know, I, I love these films, um, but it's just that that's not what they're doing. And yeah, the relationship with, with TV, um, I wouldn't say that I would watch his episodes of his show and sort of know it's him um, in that sense. But what I would say is that if you look at his body of work, um, you, you know, he's made TV films, TV, TV movies. So My Little Honeymoon was made was made for television. And um, in the format, for instance, so you, you see a sort of it split in half, obviously, where there would be the commercial break or where that would have played the next day. But actually, what I like is that he uses that um, for his own purposes, because, again, it's sort of most of his films and, and TV shows are split in half and they sort of uh, sort of look at this idea of duality in some way. So he actually makes use of that, with the two sort of environmentalist perspectives of each half. For instance, um, same with the recent TV series, uh, they were said at some two. So you've got the first half about politics, the second half is about something completely different. So I think he does exploit the form to fit with his own preoccupations. Um, but clearly, you could link that, I guess, to, to sort of TV theory more generally um, in terms of um, the sort of the, the repetition, the flow of, of, of overlaying narratives again and again. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Shall you? Um, yeah. Um, well, I think see, did you mention that you you have some more questions? Yes, I I, I actually have uh, uh, one more, if I may. Is that okay? Um, I, I was uh, wondering because you 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 did clarify um, at the beginning that. Um, He's a director as well as a quite well-known actor and, and quite, uh, you know, highly achieved, well-respected. What, mm. How do you think this dual identity affect his filmmaking? I know you, you, you mentioned about performance, very important. Now I'm just thinking why, if that's the case, he's a professional uh, performer, why did he like to use non-professional performers so much? Mm. I mean, I, I think, I mean, he, I, he doesn't use, he uses non-professional sometimes. So Wawa Nusidal is like an obvious mm. example of, of the use, but then there's a particular reason for that. And that's, there's actually, that's maybe part of a, a general trend in films about indigenous communities that they, like Laha Mabao, mm -hmm. her films also all use uh, non-professionals. And mm -hmm. there's, there's a, I mean, partly is about, um, showing something more authentic um, mm. and, and being respectful of particular communities to sort of allow them to represent themselves to some degree. Um, so that I think with that film, there's that um, 
there's a range of things going on. Um, doesn't use non-professional so much in any of his other mm. work. Um, yeah, I mean, how he divided the uh, the directing on Wawa no Sidel was quite interesting because he actually took the professional actors. So it was Ado and then I've got his name, but the guy who plays the estate agent. Yeah. And he directed those two, while um, Legal Shumi did the did the others basically. So the the kids, the grandpa, and then all the non professionals. Mm. So um, there was a conscious choice made in that film to sort of divide those duties by how professional they were. Um, and I and I think that again was because they you know Legal was you know, he knew the community. He he uh, he was he was he knew how to work with them mm. and um, what they expected. Yeah, because it's so powerful. For for example, all the elderly, uh, you know, uh, their performance is really not just natural, but it's really sincere. So it's actually make the professional look not as yeah. good as them. Well, that's for for the audience to say, of course. Um, okay, if we we ask about this duality of uh, identity, I, I actually want to ask you, because you are a fi filmmaker as well as a film scholar. Um, yesterday, during the uh, roundtable, uh, we had, it's my personal observation, I, I found that um, uh, the discussion actually go down this kind of two parallel line of film study scholars have a little bit uh, different approach. Well, I know they are all here, so I can't, um, maybe they don't agree with me, but I feel as a filmmaker and as a film scholar, maybe you have a different take uh, when you're uh, analyzing films, for example, Zheng's films. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's probably inevitable. I mean, I always try to like step, step aside from that at some level, but no, I think it's inevitable that mainly in some of the, um, the uh, because I think you do just become so much more aware of the, of the sheer practicalities um, of a production. Um, but then sometimes this can, I think, shed new light on why people do things. So, mm -hmm. for instance, um, one thing I'm always conscious of is Lin Wawa no Sida, for instance, some of those some of those scenes, although they don't seem that they would be that difficult to shoot, they're actually really difficult to shoot. Uh, for example, on the beach with the rocks, it looks like it's just next to the village. And I think geographically it's, it's, it is pretty close to the village. But the point is, if you're walking there and setting up a camera, and they used a red epic, so there's a reasonable amount of kit there. Um, these, you know, and I know from the location as well, this is this is very difficult just to walk down there and set up um, right. these massive rocks. You know, you're you're talking about crew, the actors, where are the toilets going to be? Yeah, so there's, there's a whole kind of set of practical questions that come into play, and you sort of realise the the achievement of being able right. to do that. And also some of the difficulties. So he, he did mention um, sort of um, with the non-professionals that at, at times they did, you know, they were giving kind of effective performances. They were sort of acting for the camera. And so actually he would have to leave, leave the camera running uh, for a while and sort of while they thought it was a rehearsal. Um, so that sort of in terms of techniques, again, you become maybe a bit more focused on how things happened in practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot lately in relation to forests. So, oh. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that, and again, if you want something that defines a lot of recent films in terms of the environment, like we've got a lot of films about forests suddenly appeared in the last decade, you know, mountain forests, and they haven't really featured in Taiwanese films since the 70s, um, you know, in, in sort of the martial arts genre. And yet we've got Starry Starry Night, there was Forest Debussy, we've got the Tagalong series and a range of other films. And suddenly forests, trees, mountains are kind of there a lot. So, um, and this is sort of interesting for a number of ways, but thinking from as a filmmaker, um, I think the reason why that can happen is partly down to the, the ability to di digital technology, because mm -hmm. simply you wouldn't be able to take a crew up to those places in previous decades, whereas now it is possible even though it's very difficult so in Freud WC the the, um, the the crew pretty much had to hike for three or four hours again with all the kit on their on their bags in order to get this sort of beautiful beautiful cinematography of the of the of the of the forest landscapes but again this wasn't wasn't easy and I, I guess 
as a filmmaker, I'd be potentially just a bit more attuned to that, like yeah. because I'm sort of showing in isolated landscapes myself. It's, it's very difficult. But then that's that's one reason I think why we've seen these these films appear um, a bit more is because the, the technology allows. Um, oh. So so how about, how about drone? Are they using drone or? You you certainly I mean we certainly see a few drone shots in um, in some recent films. I mean obviously you've got um, uh, there's a the English translation was a, a ground. It's a sort of it's the hexagram adaptation. He uses drone shots at the end there. He goes over Ludal to film the prison and sort of uh, zooms uh, zooms in and goes through into the prison. Um, so you're seeing some drone shots. So the thing is they're I mean, they're, they're quite tricky because they're often visibly different to um, the the camera that the film is shot on. So you can tell the difference when because we can't obviously get a heavy camera on a drone. Um, but I haven't seen too many drone shots. There was obviously the, the famous aerial for, aerial film that Ho yeah. used, but that was not that that wasn't a drone. No. So, but, uh, yeah. hmm. Oh, and oh, someone said. Godspeed. Godspeed. Were there drones in that? I'm just trying to think. Drone. <laughs> no drone. Don't. <laughs> no, sorry, because there's a lot of. I can't see the chat, so I don't know. It's on the on, in the film. That's why I was wondering oh. if there are some drones uh, thing. Um. I, I would say that there were probably, I mean, I don't know, but I, I, was, I wouldn't say there were drones. I think there were helicopter shots mm. in, in Godspeed, yeah. Yeah. You know, yesterday, yeah. Robert Chen, Chen uh, Professor Chen uh, was talking about uh, his analysis on uh, this, this period of uh, new directors. And, and he was saying, actually, he saw this kind of uh, non-Taipei uh, landscape become the, the, the main and the, echoing what you are saying, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's um, there's been an effort because a, a lot of the sort of the 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 new the new Taiwan cinema is focused on Taipei or Kaohsiung, but whereas lately there's been a lot of films moving to, say, the suburbs of cities as well as other rural areas and landscapes such as the small islands, Lan Yu and so on, we've had more films shot there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'd be quite interested in films like um, um, Shen Shen by uh, Bon An. Um, he's another director I really like, and he sort of shot that in the suburbs of Taichung, um, mainly in a house and the surrounding areas around a house. But yeah, this is not the kind of landscape that we would generally have tended to see in in earlier cinema. I don't think, uh, uh, sort of as in in the in the seventies, eighties. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I think it's the sheer diversity of, of the landscapes. There's yeah. a sense that you know every inch of this can be can now be covered. Um, in finding Sayun um, La Hama Bao, obviously it takes the small camcorder and goes for a two day hike. I think it took to get up to that in the mountains where the ancestral village was. And um, you know there's a sense that she's able to do that with the technology, but again probably wouldn't have been possible even ten years before that. Mm. And Xiao Yi, is there any more questions? Um, I think yeah, I think um, I think most of um, them are comment on um, yeah, I think Ting Ying is affirming that drones are used in Godspeed. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm prepared to accept. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. I don't um, know. Yeah. Unclear. Sorry, can you repeat again? Um, yeah, I think Ting Ying just said that um, she thinks um, drones are used in Godspeed. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ting Ying. Um, I think, wow, it's an amazing session, actually. Um, I, I couldn't imagine at the beginning that um, this is... Uh, <laughs> this is about um, you know this kind of almost like cartographic uh, mapping of uh, Zheng Zheng's uh, film and many more. Um, I have to say the time. I think uh, on that note, maybe we can wrap up uh, this session if there's no more questions. 
Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to thank our speaker. Chris, it's a fantastic to welcome you to SOAS. Uh, this is the first time you join us. I, I'm, I can see uh, the future uh, uh, appearance uh, in our event as well. And I hope that you will uh, like to come back to share your new book. I'd be delighted. Thank you. Oh, thank fantastic. You okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to say a big thank you to, to Professor, no, sorry, Dr. Brown. Right. <laughs> sorry. Yes. And, yeah. yeah. Well, it will be soon. And also our audience and all uh, fantastic uh, um, contribution from the um, our audience. And thank you very much. And uh, don't forget, we still have uh, Friday's Q&A session. So may I ask you to put your hands together if you can and, and give uh, um, uh, Chris a, a round of applause. Or you can just uh, see and say thank you.